Let me provide you with an overview of the plan towards realizing our full potential as a global green energy major. But before we turn to Ørsted, let's look at the, take a look at the external world. We are seeing that carbon emissions and temperatures are rising at an alarming speed. We are also seeing that the consequences of climate change is not just for the future, it's happening as we speak today. The risks of some of the catastrophic consequences for the planet and for humanity increasing if we do not achieve the long-term targets and ambitions of the world for the one and a half degree scenario are simply catastrophic. And that has led us at Ørsted to put up a vision of a world that runs entirely on green energy. You will notice that this is not a vision about Ørsted. This is not about a vision of a company and where we want to be. This is about a vision of a world that simply needs to run on green energy. Because production and use of energy is over 70% of total carbon emissions. And if we don't together create such a world, we are not on a good path. And we, of course, plan to use that vision to play our part, to do everything humanly possible that we as a company can inspire an entire world to support that journey. And it is something that means a lot to everything that we do. Let's take a look at what is needed for the future in terms of the energy system. The energy system will be at the core of the decarbonization journey of the world and at the core of the future energy system as we envision it will be a massive build out of renewable energy. As a matter of fact, to hit the net zero ambition for 2050 for the world, we need a build out of 27,000 gigawatts of renewable capacity. And as an example, on offshore wind, in Europe alone, we would need 450 gigawatts of offshore capacity. That's a massive build out of capacity, but also of transmission that is needed to support it. We also need new innovative solutions, such as energy islands or other transnational projects that will create interconnections between different markets, allowing for more efficient use of the energy that is produced. But not all sectors can decarbonize through electrification. There will be hard to abate sectors such as steel, heavy transport and others that will need renewable hydrogen and green fuels to decarbonize. And this is something that happens through the use of lots of the energy that is produced. But this is something which will be a backbone and as much as 12% of the total energy used by 2050 can come from green hydrogen and fuels. We do need a new and more resilient energy system to cope with as much as 90% renewable energy coming into the energy systems. That needs storage, it needs new digital solutions in order for this to be possible. And finally, we will have a new uh, energy offtaker landscape. This is not just about regions or states, it's also about large corporate offtakers. Everybody needs to do what is necessary to decarbonize. And for corporate offtakers, as an example, there will be a need for new solutions that don't necessarily exist today to support that journey. This means fantastic opportunities for companies like us in terms of the market growth. Just offshore alone will grow to an estimated seven times the current size within the next decade. We will still have Europe as the largest market, but we will see massive growth also in the US and Asia markets. And even for more mature technologies, such as onshore wind and solar, and also now newest on storage solutions, even that will grow to two and a half to three times the current size. So across existing technologies, a massive build out which will support decarbonization. But also a new and emerging market like renewable hydrogen and green fuels. This is a market that largely doesn't exist today. But projections are that this could be at a size of 80 to 100 gigawatt already by 2030. So across everything, there are huge opportunities. And the good thing is that this is being backed very tangibly by both ambitions and policy actions to make it happen. With the example of EU and US, we are seeing a new or confirmed 
targets for decarbonization, also broken down to, for example, offshore capacity needed. But most importantly, this is backed by investment plans and policy frameworks that will enable that everybody, so policymakers, companies, and everybody can lean in and make this happen. Because we cannot do it without each other, without walking in tandem. Let's take a look at what that means for our aspirations at Ørsted. And we have the not very modest ambition to become the world's leading green energy major. What do, we, what do we mean with that? Well, it is clearly a cornerstone that we must become one of the largest green electricity producers. And to back that, we will remain a global number one in offshore. That is our clear, clear ambition. But we also want to build a top 10 position in onshore. And finally, we want to be a global leader in the emerging renewable markets and green fuel market. We should not be doing build out of capacity just for the sake of it. We need to and have a clear ambition to remain one of the largest and most value creating deployers of capital into the green transformation. Because that build out and value creation needs to happen in tandem, both for us to be able to finance the build out but also because for the trust of our investors and other stakeholders, we need to ensure that we run a commercial company. With ambitions like that, we simply need the best talent. So we have an ambition to become the world's leading talent platform, so we get the very best people, the very best team to support our journey. And then we have a clear ambition, not just to solidify and stay where we are in terms of sustainability leadership, because we have had the privilege already last year to be named the world's most sustainable company across any industry. And three years in a row to be the world's most sustainable energy company. But we don't rest on our laurels. We plan to continue to up our ambition to continue to be a role model for other companies to follow. And on that note, it is also our aspiration to not only be a core contributor, but a catalyst for change towards a world that runs entirely on green energy. And what does that mean? Well, it means we will constantly strive to do things that others either cannot or do not dare to do in order to ensure that we inspire others to go towards the change that the world so desperately needs. If we then take a look at what does that mean for our build-out uh, uh, ambitions, we do have an ambition to increase our installed capacity from the current 12 gigawatts to approximately 50 gigawatts by 2030. This is about four times the current installed capacity, and it is a massive increase compared to the 30 gigawatt ambition that was launched at our last Capital Markets Day back in 2018. And with this ambition, we are also looking at a changed playing field, or where we choose to play and grow. Looking at the right side of this slide, you will see that it is completely unchanged that we have a clear stated ambition to stay a global leader in offshore, all regions. But we also have an ambition in onshore, now no longer as a new but a strong growth platform in the US because we have proven over the past three years that we can have a massive and value creating build out and we plan to continue to do that. And at the same time, with the recent establishment of a growth platform in Europe, we do plan to have that global expansion. And last but not least, in renewable hydrogen and green fuels, we will have Europe as the core of our growth platform. That's where we're starting, but that's not where we're ending. We will start and lean into Europe, but with an ambition to, to, scan, uh, to span globally with what we do in that important field. Let's take a look at what are some of the strategic choices we have made to support this. In offshore, we are increasing our ambition from a 15 gigawatt target by 2025 to an ambition of 30 gigawatts by 2030. So that means that we're accelerating our build out in the back half of this decade to three gigawatts a year. We will do that through expanding our footprint. 
We mentioned examples here with the Baltics, Nordics, East Asia, but also other growth markets, because we have proven that we can open new markets effectively, and we have an intent to continue to do so. But we will also take part and take a leading role in new innovative projects like the Danish energy islands. This is something that could be an absolute cornerstone of the energy systems of the future, and we want to play our leading role. And then we are also making a choice that we want a strong position in floating offshore wind. If we look at the long term, so especially beyond 2030, floating will become a massive potential. And this is something that if we, even beyond that period, have a clear intent to be an undisputed leader in offshore, we also want to lean in and drive floating offshore wind. Turning towards onshore, we are also increasing our ambition there. As a matter of fact, we're increasing it a lot from an ambition of 5 gigawatts by 2025 to 17 and a half gigawatts by 2030. So a massive increase in ambition level. And we will do that through continuing to accelerate our US build out that has proven that it is very scalable, but also to globalize our platform starting in Europe. And then on technologies, we are also making the choice to become a multi-technology player. So we will, and we are seeing examples of that already in the US market, we will combine different technologies. So onshore wind, solar PV, storage, maybe all three of them. But this is something we believe will become a huge advantage and by the way needed for our customers and off-takers. And then to renewable hydrogen and green fuels. As already mentioned, our ambition is to build a global leadership position. The backbone of how we plan to materialize that and realize that is to execute on our already existing pipeline of projects in Europe, which sums up to well over three gigawatts of capacity. That will give us not only the initial scale, but also invaluable learnings to be able to scale beyond the execution of those projects. And then we will also lean into selected renewable hydrogen and green fuels value chains together with some of our offtake partners. So that means, in other words, that playing beyond renewable electricity generation and electrolysis is something we will selectively do. You might ask, why doesn't a company like us just stay with our current majority core business, namely offshore? Why should we dive, sort of go into these new areas? Well, we believe that the choices we are making have very meaningful synergies and distinct competitive advantages. And starting with maybe the most obvious one, the procurement synergies from simply being a bigger procurer of renewable technologies, that's a very tangible financial uh, ambition and something that we can materialize. But also, we are already today seeing that our customers demand multi-technology solutions. So this is a way to be able to offer to any off-taker a much more integrated decarbonization solution to be able, by having those technologies at hand. But also through a global presence that will, through the, the areas where we already have our different technologies in play, we will enable that we can create stronger transnational solutions to our customers. And by the way, if we are already present with one technology in one part of the world, market entry can be made a lot easier if we want to go in with other technologies as well. And then, very importantly, with our vision, we must see a decarbonization of the hard to abate sectors. And their synergies there into large scale renewable generation simply is something that is so obvious for us to leverage through renewable hydrogen and green fuels. If we take a look at our financial targets, then our target on operational earnings is still a double digit growth in EBDA from operating assets in onshore and offshore towards 2027. More specifically, around 12% is the average growth that we are looking at. And if we turn towards the new projects, then it is also clearly still our ambition to stay a value creating developer. And we, we plan to do that by having a target range between 150 to 300 basis points. And bear in mind that this is based on the toughest financial value criteria possible 
namely with a fully loaded unlevered life cycle IRR. And if I then finish with sustainability, because on top of financial targets that are of course vital for us to get the credibility and the ability to continue to invest, then sustainability is also very much at the core we do. And we are reconfirming our targets of by 2025 to have a fully carbon neutral energy production. And by 2040 to be fully carbon neutral, including our scope three. And both of those will be based on science-based targets, so fully trustworthy and credible, which we believe, by the way, everybody should do. But on top of confirming those targets, we are also taken the opportunity now to take a stand on biodiversity. As you saw in the very beginning of my presentation, the single biggest threat to biodiversity is climate change. But on top of that contribution, by helping to decarbonize the world, we believe that with a massive build-out of renewable energy that is needed, we simply also want to ensure that that happens in pact with nature. And that is why no later than 2030, all our new projects must have a positive biodiversity impact. We will start taking actions way before that, but that is a deadline where we set ourselves and saying this is when that must happen. And on top of that, we are also announcing as of now a ban on landfill for wind turbine blades. So with these new ambitions, we plan to uphold a clear leadership on sustainability, of course centered around decarbonization, but also much beyond that, which already today has led us to be a globally leading sustainability player. With that, let me finish by taking you on a trip into the real world, more specifically to Taiwan, and even more specifically hosted by my great colleagues Frida and Ulrich, who will show you some of the progress in a video of our Greater Shanghai 1 and 2A construction that is happening despite very challenging uh, circumstances driven by COVID-19 that is still progressing well and headed towards another on-time, on-budget delivery. We want to take you now straight to the front line of the execution of the Shanghua 1 and 2A project. And this is a project where we have taken us through all the spectrum. We have started in the development phase. We have the EPC phase, where engineering, procurement and construction. And at the end, we will have the operation, which is also being done by Ørsted in this project. Let's start to show you the scale and the magnitude of our project and both the onshore and the offshore works that is ongoing. And all this has translated to a lot of experience that's been shared, a lot of new jobs has been created and the local supply chain has been built up. And all this is contributed to the local economy. To execute the first utility scale offshore wind farm in APAC, we blend Ørsted's world-class expertise with the experience and capabilities of our local suppliers and partners. On the supply chain side, we have pursued an overall strategy to have a global setup. We also have a local supplier in Taiwan to build and construct the substation. When we started the project some years ago, there was no key site, but now the key site have been constructed by the Taichung Port Authorities and we have successfully started to use it directly after completion. We are in the middle of manufacturing turbine towers and transporting them. But we have also reached a very significant milestone of installing the first offshore jacket. And the offshore construction will be supported by a wide range of marine engineering, vessel supply, and the people from home and abroad. We estimate on the peak times we will have 25 vessels at sea 
including five to 800 people working at sea. We are working with international and local suppliers. And on the Shangwa 1 and 2A project, we are having 111 locally made towers for the turbine structures. In addition, the nacelles will be locally clicked here in Taishung port at the nacelle clicking facility, which is the first of the kind outside of Europe. Despite the many challenges there is with executing in a new market and now with the COVID-19 situation, the project team has managed to keep the project on track, on time and on budget. And we are confident that we will deliver first power in the first half of 2022 and we will complete all offshore installation works by the end of 2022, as agreed at the FID gate. This is proof of Ørsted's model and the 30 years of experience and the extreme talent team that we have executing this project. Some of our team members has been expatriated to Taiwan or to other countries where we have fabrication ongoing. And many are new colleagues that has joined the team and they have truly have steep learning curves and we're working together as a strong team. We are working in the market with very limited offshore wind experience but by hard work, dedicated team and the right approach, all the major permits are now in place. From the beginning of the project, we have had high focus on safety. And we are here and we are sharing our experience from the offshore wind industry with our new suppliers in the new markets. And we do this in many ways. We have our team here on the ground at the facilities of our suppliers, working together and sharing our experience in order for them to meet our QHC requirements. In addition to creating jobs and building up manufacturing facilities, we also train people on the ground. That's because we built to operate, because we want to ensure that we have a solid and a skillful operational setup to operate our Changba 1 and 2A wind farms. Moreover, we sent local technicians to operating assets in Europe to be up qualified. In fact, the first batch of local technicians have just been sent to the UK for an eight month long training course and get the direct learning from an operating asset that they can bring back to operate our Greater Changhua 1 and 2A wind farms. Executing a global project with a global diverse team in a new market requires a very strong project culture. And we have created that in the Shanghua project and we have truly embraced the local cultures in the new markets, visiting the temples and participating in ceremonies before we start construction works or before we start any offshore works. Finally, we are happily opening many new facilities and factories together with our suppliers and we are sharing in celebrations after the successes. In Taiwan, we have proven that we can scale up Ørsted EPC model and we can truly execute successfully in a new market. With this, we are on our journey, creating new energy together for a greater tomorrow, San Taiwan.